Okay, Phyllis, right before the break, uh, you were very much uh, in disagreement with Cynthia. Would you like, we were talking about the use, usefulness of violence uh, committed by the United States against Syria. Go ahead. Well, I think there's two points. One is that what the president has proposed is a small, surgical, limited, how many adjectives can we come up with to say it's going to be a really tiny military strike, which is not designed to take out any capacity, will kill people, according to the Pentagon, because they admit that the cruise missiles are not very, uh, are not very controllable in terms of hitting their target. So what are we really talking about here? We're talking about killing people to punish their government for using an illegal weapon. The, the point is not, when we talk about the leadership of the United States, I think that Cynthia is right that U.S. leadership has been defined solely as military in recent years, and right now we're seeing a huge crisis of the militarization of U.S. foreign policy, the militarization of diplomacy. What we need is a return to real diplomacy, forceful diplomacy, that includes, for example, an arms embargo on all sides in Syria, so that we get the Russians to stop sending arms to the regime and get the, the Iranians to do the same thing, while we get our partners in Saudi Arabia Arabia and Qatar and Jordan and Turkey to stop arming the other side. Without that kind of an arms embargo, but the, that, that the fighting sounds is like going a great to go idea, on. But how That's could we ever get anyone to do that? To the table. Uh, Cynthia, go ahead. If I don't. We, I don't think. I, I, I don't I totally think this, 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 no longer. The Saudis if, won't cooperate. If we That's will for no sure. No longer send weapons to the Saudis. We tell the Saudis we're not going to send them any more weapons and we're not going to send them any more spare parts. We start telling Boeing that we're going to treat them the way the. Uh, the way the agriculture department treats farmers, pay them not to produce weapons, pay them to retool their factory to yeah. build solar panels instead of military equipment. Okay. We'd go a lot farther. Let the me go to Jason here. Well, that's, 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 that's a great idea. Let me go to Jason I, here. Let's go to Jason. Never do that. Jason, that sounds like a great idea, but it's never going to happen. There's no political We're, will for that. Absolutely. After the last 10 years, well, we I think we, political we, will. We, well, we, we are in a great position. We're in a great position to bring both the rebels and Assad to the table. The last thing Assad wants is a full-scale military intervention. The last thing the rebels want is a den uh, denial of U.S. support. If we take our support away, the rebel movement, I think, will collapse and, and Assad will, will roll, roll right over it and reinstall his power. But I think we, we're in a position to bring them to the table. But as you say, it's never going to happen because I think what we're executing is that old Donald Rumsfeld plan of seven nations in five years. Really, we're, we're you know, the, the schedule's a little bit off. We're going a little slowly, but we are, I think, ultimately trying to isolate uh, Iran here and getting rid of the Assad regime, which is an Iranian ally, uh, potentially then Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, would totally isolate Iran and would allow us to clear the field for a buildup of an attack against uh, Iran's uh, nuclear power uh, capabilities. Phyllis, does that make the possibility of an Which attack would, on Syria even greater us, in your mind? You just heard the scenario. Middle Eastern oil you, and gas. you just heard the scenario from Jason. That is. Go ahead, pick it, up on it. Phyllis, go ahead. It does. It does make. It does make the possibility even greater. This is partly because Israel has only recently come into the equation supporting a strike against uh, Syria, which they had not been supporting earlier, largely because the regime of both Hafez al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad, despite all the rhetoric about resistance and this and that, have actually been very useful to Israel, kept the occupied Golan Heights quiet, kept the border secure, yeah. kept the Palestinians in Syria under very tight control. So this has been a very useful regime for Israel as a neighbor. And only now, when there is this threat because of the language of so-called red lines, that Israel has weighed in saying you can't not respond militarily to a red line being crossed in Syria, because if you do, Iran will get the idea that a red line can be crossed on their side and we won't respond militarily. The problem is, again, it comes back to what's going to happen the day after. Syria or Iran have enormous possibilities for retaliation against the United States, against Israel, against U.S. allies in the region. And there's no talk in Washington about what comes next. We can talk all we want about this being a small-scale, limited war, a limited attack. But when and if Syria or Iran or somebody else retaliates the next day, then what happens? That's when you start hearing about larger-scale well, intervention and boots on the ground. Cynthia, do you want to react to that? I, well, I, I seriously, I seriously doubt anything about boots on the ground, and it's absolutely correct that Syria is a quagmire, and we're not going to try to solve it with attacked? whatever action we take. But what, 
we, what is unfortunate is, I'd like to come back to the situation in the United States, what is unfortunate is that President Obama has lost, I think, the advantage he had of acting quickly, which an action which had to be followed and accompanied, indeed, by strong diplomatic pressure. And we wouldn't have acted alone. We, France was willing to act with us and Turkey. Now, by taking this much time and not even calling the Congress back, I think the chances of Congress supporting this are slim. I can guarantee that when they're, and you've already said, 9% among the American public, when they're out talking in the public, there's not going to be support of this. This is a case which really requires international leadership and, yes, also strong international diplomacy. And President Obama is trying to have it er all ways, you know, trying to please everyone. And by losing time, he gives Assad plenty of time to prepare for whatever is coming, as well as Iran. And so I fear he may have lost whatever advantage, whatever strength may have come from this uh, had he acted earlier. Jason? What do you think of that? It gives us time to fight against well, the possibility you, of militarization. Have... Go ahead, Jason. You have maps in USA Today showing the different places <laughs> where strikes will be conducted. It's on all the talk shows everyone's talking about. So it's certainly not a surprise to anyone. And Syria, I'm sure, has been doing their best to uh, prepare for it. You know, I think that uh, President Obama, if he doesn't get, he was on the television this morning saying that Syria represented a direct uh, national security threat How to the United possible? States. How is that possible? How is that possible? How is that possible? And I, I th it's absurd. It's not possible. It's 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 a it's a ridiculous claim. But he's yeah. making this case for to Congress. And when you make statements like that, I think even if Congress says no, he will use NATO. He will go with NATO and go in. Uh, really, to sadly, to save face and not be characterized That's, as I'm uh, glad you yeah. bring up Make saving face. No. I'm terror. glad you're bringing up saving face, Phyllis. Obama, this is his dilemma: saving face, his That's credibility. That's a lot of what's at stake here. Go ahead. That's it. It's the credibility. credibility has been miscreated. The, the, no, I the don't think that's the only thing that's The credibility factor about the so-called red line is the problem, and that's what we're looking at. The excuse that chemical weapons are a violation of international law is absolutely right, and I wish that the U.S. had taken that position before it, for example, sent targeting satellite material to Iraq to use chemical weapons against Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. I wish they had used it to prevent the—, uh, the, the, the um, uh, the small off outfit here outside of Washington that sent the biological weapon seed stock to Saddam Hussein's government. I wish the U.S. then had said, this is illegal, we can't be part of it. To say it now has a bit of hypocrisy there. It should be responded to. There should be well, accountability it, you know, better for anyone never. who uses I mean, these it's weapons. Better to that stop accountability does not come from, from it though. doesn't come militarily. Nothing in international law allows the use of military force by one country to punish the government of another country for a violation. It was not aimed at us. This is not self-defense. It is not our interests that are at stake here. It's the people of Syria. And if we want to be serious about defending their rights, the first thing we can do is not send missiles against them. Okay, Cynthia, would you like to reply to that? Well, we have, we have done this well, before, it's, as it's in the case of Kosovo, and have done it effectively. So there is precedent illegal. for Kosovo this. Kosovo was illegal. Uh, and <laughs> And a lot of people were Illegal killed. Press. A well, lot of civilians were killed on top we of it as well. We did it and prevented more a genocide. People, so uh, we, I mean, there's not a whole lot of point no, in arguing about it now. There is a You know, as long Cynthia, as international sorry, law is requiring the UN to okay things, and the UN will never okay anything, it becomes, you know, a hopeless case. Uh, but I do think in this case, President Obama hopeless, and it was has really Kosovo, cut and himself off at the knees. Okay, what, hap what happened to international I law pardon? here? I mean, ask the people okay. of Kosovo. Jason. And ask the piece of people of Kosovo the people if it of, worked. Well, I mean, th people there was a Kosovo, slaughter. Go ahead, Jason, ju no, Jason jump in. Go ahead. Out of Go ahead, Jason. After the NATO international bombing. law is being, you know, disregarded here. I mean, the, the Supreme, as Justice Robert Jackson said, he was our uh, chief counsel at the Nuremberg trial of Nazi cr war criminals. He said the supreme international crime, and this has been kind of the de facto uh, legal, international, I think, legal opinion since, the supreme international crime is a war of aggression because it contains within it the accumulated evil of everything that comes after it. And I think that's what we're facing here is um, a war of aggression, and we haven't 
even begun to address the fallout of that uh, the, and the blowback of that war of aggression. And we've seen in Libya, we've, it's what? ruled by militias now. We overthrew the, um, the, the regime there, but now we're, it's ruled by militias. Iraq is a, a, a frayed nation uh, threatening to split into, into three partitions. Afghanistan is a failed state. The NATO general just said yesterday they na may need five more years of uh, NATO and U.S. support before the, uh, their armed forces in Afghanistan can stand on their own. I mean, we're just creating, we're destabilizing countries all no, around, look, around I, the I Middle in, East, and I you have to wonder if that's okay, part give of Cynthia the, the last well, word, the, the to be fair. Go ahead, Cynthia, go ahead. I am in violent agreement with you about the problems of the militarization of U.S. foreign policy. You only have to look at Egypt for that. You know, that's all we do is deal with the military, and they don't even listen to us. It's a complete and total failure. I agree with you on that. I do, however, think in the case of this humanitarian catastrophe and gross violation uh, of international law, human rights, and every standard you can think of, that there needs to be a vigorous response from the United States, and I think there has to be some kind of targeted military response accompanied by uh, use, you know, using that as pressure to get the sides to the bargaining table. I don't see what all people right, think folks, that we've run out of time. Get I hope I hope all parties involved will push for diplomacy. Many thanks today to my guests in Washington and in New York, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.